So, um, I thought I'd better begin by asking a very basic question. Why is research done at CCDC? And I think there's a number of reasons. The first is that sometimes when you're developing the software tools that CSD users uh, use, then you have to do some research you know, in the course of that. The second reason is because it advertises the value of the CSD. Now, that's not very important now because everybody recognises the value of the CSD. But believe me, it was important in the earlier years. <coughs> Third reason, because the best way of understanding what a user wants out of the software that you're developing is to actually be a user yourself. Fourthly, and I think this is probably the most important reason now, because by doing research, then CCDC maintains contacts, it, it creates credibility and a profile within the community, and I think that is crucially important. And this is actually a good point for uh, which to say most of the work, perhaps two thirds of the work that CCDC has done in the research arena has been in collaboration. And the collaborators over the years have been wonderful. Um, and you know, we've got a huge amount out of that. I hope they've got something out of it as well. And then finally, because I'm an honest guy, uh, we do research because we like doing research. So I'm going to start with two overview slides. So this one is uh, a histogram of the number of papers published uh, by CCDC, either solely or in collaboration, um, as a function of year. And you see it's kind of spiky, but there's a general trend upwards as we, as we, go, as we go through the years. And the, 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 the peak around about the sort of 2005 era that, I think, has got a lot to do with the Pfizer Research Institute, of which more later. Now, this is a more interesting slide. Each bar in this slide <coughs> corresponds to a five-year period. And each colour corresponds to a type of research. And for a given bar, the length, the length that a colour occupies is proportional to the number of papers that, that were published in that arena. So if we get the forget about the science for a moment and just concentrate on the colours, you can see that CCDC started out in a very yellow mood. And then as the time went, went on, it moved through a green phase until now when it's predominantly pink with lashes of black. So to put that into a scientific context, yellow means structure solution. So as Olga said, when it started and for many years afterwards, the guys at CCDC solved crystal structures. That's what they did. And then in the middle years, the green represents um, using the CSD as a research tool to understand the basic properties of molecules, their dimensions, their conformational preferences, their interactions. And then in recent years, that has been supplanted. And the predominant area now is what I will loosely call the crystal form, uh, things like the systematics of crystal packing, polymorphism. And the smaller but still essential contribution is the use of the CSD for drug design. That's, that's the black bit. And that's, that's immensely important, not least because CCDC gets a lot of its income from the pharmaceutical industry. And then the, the other colour is, is the blue at the top. And that's, that's kind of, you know, it's small but constant, ever present. And that's the research we do um, in the course of developing software. So you can see that over the course of years, there have been trends in the research done at CCDC, which, of course, is what you'd expect. OK, so I'm now going to do some crystal engineering. And I'm going to start with this structure here, which is um, uh, one of the very first with 3D coordinates, actually, in the CSD. It was published in 1956, and I looked. There were about 300 structures in the CSD published in 1956 or before that with 3D coordinates. So this, this is a pioneer. And I've added H atoms in calculated positions. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack several unit cells along the long C-axis. And now in a move unprecedented in the history of crystal engineering, I'm going to add two dates. And here we have a crystal structure timeline. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is I'm going to wander along that timeline in strict chronological fashion. And every now and then, I'm going to stop and say a few words, because that's all I've got time to do, say a few words about this paper or that paper. And the papers that I've chosen are not necessarily the, the most highly cited, although some of them certainly are highly cited. 
they're not necessarily the best, although I think they're, they're all good. But, but what I've tried to do is to pick a set of papers that collectively represents the breadth of the research done at, C at, at CCDC. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and in case you get bored of me droning on, for each year that I take a paper from, I've got a topical picture and you can amuse yourself by identifying those if you want. So my first stop is in 1978. So what I'm not going to talk about are any actual crystal structure determinations because it's very hard to find a representative paper of those. Um, but I'll stop in 1978 with what is truly a landmark paper for CCDC. Um, it was published by Peter Murray Ross, who at the time was at the University of Stirling, and Sam Motherwell, who of course was at CCDC. And what these guys looked at was the geometry of the sugaring in nucleosides. And the reason it's a landmark paper is because it is the first paper with a CCDC author where the CSD was used as a research tool to find out something of chemical significance. Um, so what they, what they did was they, they looked at the sugar ring, um, they, they found 100 odd examples in the CSD, they used all the proper torsion angles that you can define for, for that fragment to characterise the geometry, and then they put it into principal components analysis. And in, you know, in, those, in those days, that was an avant-garde sort of thing to do in, in crystallography. And what the PCA told them, that there were three significant eigenvalues, so you have a system here with three conformational degrees of freedom, and by plotting the, the first two eigenvectors, that's the plot on the, the bottom right, you can see immediately that this sugar ring exists predominantly in two conformations. Now, to be honest, nucleic acid chemists already knew this at the time, but what Peter and Sam had shown was that you could get this sort of result by analysing the data in the CSD. And actually, as it happens in this case, you could get it by putting it into a, a more or less black box statistical procedure. And that was very much a guideline for, for, for many studies to come. OK, the same pa paper is also a landmark. Um, and that's because this is the first paper where CCDC folk use the CSD to find out something about a molecular interaction. And in this case, it was the interaction between CH groups and electronegative atoms like oxygen, nitrogen, and chloride. Now, this is a bit of a controversial topic. In 1962, June Sutra had published a paper suggesting that CHO interactions in crystal structures could be called hydrogen bonds. She, um, she was rebutted um, scathingly, really, in 1968 by Jerry Donoghue, who looked at the CHO interaction, looked at various examples, discussed them, asked, is it, is it, a, CH, is it a hydrogen bond? And, and answered unequivocally, no, it isn't. Um, the, that controversy kind of rumbled on. And it's interesting that, that when we got the referees' reports on our paper, one of them said, I don't think you should call these things hydrogen bonds. I think you should call them suitors, referring back, of course, to during suitor. And it's, it's irresistible to speculate that, that might have been Jerry Donahue, who was still alive and working at the time. I might be a heretic here. I don't actually think it matters very much whether you call these things hydrogen bonds or not. I think what matters is whether they are sufficiently attractive to have an influence on the way that molecules pack or bind to protein binding sites. And, and to me, the compelling evidence from the paper came just from looking at the CH groups that form the, the shortest uh, context to oxygen. And they're, they're, they're the hydrogen atoms shown in purple here. And they're, they're all CH groups in strongly electron withdrawing environments, which suggests these are not random contexts. There's something systematic going on here. <coughs> OK, so my next stop is a twin stop in 1987 and 1989. And I'm going to talk about the famous bond length papers. So, in case you don't know, these are huge tabulations of average bond lengths derived from the CSD for thousands of different types of chemical bond. Um, uh, it's published in two papers. There were several authors on those papers, of which I was one, but I was the smartest because I left CCDC about two, two months after the project started and thereby avoided the vast majority of the work that was done and it was a huge amount of work. The short straw was, was, was drawn by our collaborators in Bristol, Guy Orpen and, and Lee Brammer, because they had to do the organometallic table, which is, I don't know, it's about 70 pages long. Um, so here's a little extract from the organometallic uh, uh, table, and just look at the, at the, the detail they've gone into. They've broken 
broken bonds down by the coordination number of the metal, by the oxidation state, high spin and low spin. I can barely remember what high spin and low spin mean. And loads and loads of, of footnotes about this structure and that structure. And you have to remember, all of this was done primarily manually. You know, you do a substructure search, you look at the histogram, you look at the outliers, you understand it. Tremendous amount of work. Now, if you were hard, you might say to me, yeah, but this isn't really research, this is data compilation. And maybe it is, but it's useful because between those two papers, they've got over 12,000 citations. OK, so if you didn't think that was proper research, you definitely won't think that this is proper research. This is the paper describing the SIF. And, and following Gillian's talk, I don't need to tell you what the SIF is. Um, and, and it, of course, it isn't research. It's, it's basically the design of a file format. But I have no apologies for picking this paper because I think you could make a strong case that this is the most important paper that CCDC has ever published. Because without the SIF, the maintenance of the CSD, I think, would have become impossible. Now, this is, um, uh, this is an appropriate moment for me to mention Frank Allen, um, who, as you all will know, died in November of last year. And he was the CSD, CCDC author on that paper. And I had the privilege, but obviously unhappy privilege, of, of writing his obituary for Actor Christ. And I did what anybody would have done. I emailed some folk and asked them for suggestions as to what I might say. And Jack Dunnett, who has a knack of capturing things very succinctly, emailed back and he said, Frank played a pivotal role in the transformation of the CSD from a data bank to a scientific instrument. And the fact it's a scientific instrument, of course, is why we're all here today. But I, you know, I thought, absolutely, that captures the scientific part of Frank's life absolutely perfectly. And really, I, you know, I could have got away with saying nothing more about it. The photo there was taken by one of the other SIF um, uh, originator, Sid Hall, at the 1987 Perth IUCR meeting. OK, so now I'm moving on to 1999. And this is one of those papers where the CSD is used with an eye towards drug design. It describes a program called Superstar. And what Superstar does is, is kind of represented by the pictures on the left here. The picture at the top is taken from Isostar and is based on CSD data. And it shows the probability density of hydrogen bond donor groups around, around the carbonyl group of, of, of amides. Now, what Superstar does is it takes that sort of information and it uses it to create a surface on a protein binding site, indicating where a particular uh, uh, type of group will want to be. So in this case, uh, the uh, bottom left, the, the surface shows where OH groups want to be. And the green molecule is just a ligand in its observed position. <coughs> just to show you that the OH groups of that, that, that ligand actually do sit where they're predicted to sit. But actually, that's not what I want to say about this paper. What I want to say is about the plots on the right which almost kind of fell out by accident. The plot at the top is based on CC and CO contacts in the CSD. The plot at the bottom is based on protein ligand con contacts in the PDB. And what they are are radial density distribution, so density of contacts uh, plotted against distance. And the, and the CO curves have been, um, have been normalised so that at long distances they have the same density as the CC curves. And the points of interest are the relative heights of the peaks at their maxima. And you can see that relative to CO, CC contacts are hugely more common in the PDB than in the uh, CSD. And by the normalisation, we've taken stoichiometric factors out of it. So I, I was stunned when I saw this result, which is Marcel Fadong's result because it's the first time I saw, you know, such convincing evidence that, the, you know, the interactions in protein ligand complexes and, and small molecule structures are not quite the same. And, you know, you can talk about, you know, solvation and, and, and you know, filling hydrophobic pockets and stuff, but it, it, to me it was still a very dramatic result. Right, so on to the millennium then. Um, and I'm not going to actually talk about this paper at all, but I am going to talk about the context in which it sits. This was the first of the CCDC blind tests of crystal structure prediction. So just in case you don't know, what happens is 
the, the CCDC finds a, a friendly crystallographer, gets them to solve four, five, six crystal structures. They hold the results back and they invite groups around the world to predict those structures. And then everybody gets together after about 18 months and discusses and analyzes. Uh, they're on the sixth blind test now. And I'm sure that everybody in that research field will agree with me that the blind tests have been a ter terrific focus for, for effort in that area. OK, uh, right, so now sort of uh, departure in a new direction. In the early years of this century, um, CCDC um, uh, made an agreement with Bill David and Ken Shankland that they would distribute um, those guys' program DASH, which, which solves uh, 3D crystal structures from powder diffraction data. And this is an example of the use of DASH. Um, so it's on tetracaine, which is um, a flexible molecule. It's got nine rotatable torsions. There's a chloride counter ion. So there's 18 variables in all. This is quite a difficult problem. It certainly was then. I assume it still is for, for solving by, from powder data. And what I really like about it is the way that CSD data was used. It was used to help solve the structure. Um, the, the, the guys notice that, you know, if you look at histograms from the CSD, the ester group is pretty much always within 20 degrees of planarity. So they use that to restrict the torsional freedom of that group and hence reduce search space. And then also they, um, they use CSD data in, in the refinement, uh, using CSD values to restrain the bond lengths and some of the bond angles. So I kind of like that because you know, the, the CSD is built basically from the, the donations of practicing crystal structure determining people. And now it's feeding back and, and helping determine crystal structures. OK, so 2003. OK, so this paper is a representative of studies of the systematics of crystal packing. Um, so what they were looking at in particular was the correlation between molecular symmetry and crystallographic symmetry. And it you know, it's, covers quite a few things, this paper. So I'll just cherry pick one or two things. They found that space groups with symmetry elements unfavorable to close packing uh, are almost never occupied by molecules with C1 symmetry, in other words, no symmetry. The plot on the left there, each bar on that plot represents one of the space groups. And the colour of the bar um, represents the, the number of different types of special positions in that space group. And in particular, the sort of grey colour at the bottom represents space groups that have no special positions. And the length of the bar is proportional to the percentage of structures in that space group uh, that, that relate to molecules with no symmetry. And basically what, what that's telling you is that if you've got a molecule with no symmetry, predominantly, you know, they, they, they are the ones that, that occupy those, those space groups like P1 with, with no special positions. When, when the molecule does have symmetry, then there's a kind of hierarchy as to how well that's retained. If you've got an inversion centre in the molecule, the molecule almost always sits on, in, on an inversion centre in the, in, the, in, the, in the crystal lattice. If you've got, for example, a, C, a C3 rotation axis, then you get lots of the structures in rhombohedral and trigonal space groups, but equally you get, you get lots in, for example, P21 and C. So that's kind of middle ground. OK, so um, another paper from 2003. And again, I'm not going to talk about this paper, um, but it's, it's another landmark paper because it is the first paper uh, involving someone who worked for the, the Pfizer Institute. So the background to this is that Pfizer approached uh, CCDC in the early years of the century. I well remember Bob Doherty coming. And they said, well, we're thinking of setting up an institute focused on trying to understand more about the, 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 the crystal form of, of, of drug molecules. And, and, and that came about, and CCDC uh, you know, played a big role in that. And, and it, you know, that's, that's kind of led to the Crystal Form Consortium, which some of you will know about, which is several industrial companies combining together, again, to, to do research on the same subject. And the areas of interest are things like polymorphism, propensity to form hydrates, um, co-crystals, salts, um, crystal structure prediction, all issues that are of fundamental importance to pharmaceutical development. 
And I think that from CCDC's point of view, the, the Pfizer Institute absolutely galvanised research at CCDC and also sharply focused it. And that was that bump in the, in, in the histogram of number of papers per year. OK, so now I'm getting to very recent stuff. The good, the bad and the twisted, a survey of ligand geometries in protein crystal structures. So what these guys did was they took a bunch of protein ligand complexes from the PDB, some from pre-2000, some from 2000 to 2006, and some from 2006 to 2009. And they looked, looked at the ligand geometry. So if we look at this ligand geometry here, you can see there's a bond angle measured at 121.5 degrees. But if you look at the distribution of that type of bond angle in the CSD, they're all seven, eight, nine degrees larger. So based on, on that sort of analysis, what they did was they categorized every ligand geometry in their set as either OK, that's the ones in blue, or um, strained, that's the one in red, or green, questionable, which I think was their polite word for, we think this is wrong, actually. So, you know, um, interestingly, the, the number of the OK structures have definitely gone up with time, but the number of questionable are more or less flatlining there. So I think the, the value that that, that kind of highlights is, is, is the use of the CSD for, um, for, for validation. OK, and, and the last paper, I think, on my list, knowledge-based approaches to co-crystal design. So this is absolutely in the you know, Pfizer Institute, Crystal Form Consortium sort of area of interest. So there's a lot of stuff in this paper, so I'm just going to pick one example. What they did was they looked at um, co-crystallizing paracetamol with, with other molecules, co-formers. And they took 35 attempts at doing this with 35 different molecules, 14 of which were successful, the co-crystal co formed, and 21 of which were not. And then they, they asked whether they could have predicted that. And, and the model they used was a, a propensity model that was uh, devised by Pete Gallick. And what this does is it takes a given donor X and a given acceptor Y, and then it estimates the propensity for those two groups to hydrogen bond in crystal structures. And it's a function of the nature of X, the nature of Y, the competition from the other H bonding groups that happen to be lying around in the crystal structure, um, the steric accessibility of X and Y, and something to do with aromaticity that I've never actually got my head around. <laughs> so from that, they calculated what they called an MC score, which is the difference between two quantities. The first quantity was the propensity of the best hetero hydrogen bond. That is, a hydrogen, the best of the hydrogen bonds involving one paracetamol group and one group from the other molecule. And then the other, um, which they subtracted from that, was the propensity of the best homo interaction, that is, the best hydrogen bond between two paracetamol molecules, which is the one shown at the top, or the best hydrogen bond between uh, two molecules of the coformer. And you can see that the bigger that quantity is, the more positive it is, the more kind of driving force you might think there would be for forming a co-crystal rather than crystallising as separate. Now, the plus at the bottom, each bar in that histogram represents one of the 35 co-formers or putative co-formers and the colour of the bar indicates whether the experiment was successful or not. So the red ones wouldn't form co-crystals and the green ones would. And they're ordered so that the, 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 the bigger uh, MC scores are towards the left. And you can see there's a lot of noise in that plot but even so you know it is clear that there's something there and in fact you know there's a uh, 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 you can do a statistical test and establishing uh, that, that that correlation is, is, is statistically significant. So, you know, there's a lot more to be done, um, but, but there's some truth there behind the model. OK, so by way of summary then, CSD research has played a critical role in the life of CCDC. The nature of the research has evolved over the years, and, and right now the, the centre of interest is on the crystal form and all those issues that are so important to, to pharmaceutical uh, guys and indeed many other industries. Much of the best research has been done in collaboration with all the wonderful external collaborators that we've had, both from academia 
and, and industry over the years. And in particular, the Pfizer Institute had a, had a huge impact. So my remaining slide is the acknowledgement slide. And, you know, this is quite an unusual acknowledgement start slide because it's got quite a lot of pet names on it. Uh, I probably made some mistakes, but I've tried to identify everybody who has been an author or co-author on a paper um, with a CCDC affiliation. Um, so, you know, I want this talk to be a tribute to those guys and a tribute also to our fantastic collaborators. Um, so thanks to them and thanks for listening.